So a gradually uh, uh, malfunctioning immune system, gradual weakness and inability to perform even basic physical tasks for independent living, that, that, that's what goes on every day. It's what happens to most people in our country as they age, but it is not what is supposed to happen to most people. And uh, by the way, by way of example, my, my dad's almost 93 years old and he does need some assistance. We can't let him drive a car, for example, obviously, but he's living at home independently, he sleeps on his own bed and he, we, we're not gonna let him ever go to a nursing facility, all right? But, but the beginning of that ability started decades ago with the things that he did, exercise, eating right, et cetera. The effect of obesity, it reduces your immune competence. It, that, that's one of the reasons why the CDC says that people most likely to get COVID were obese, hypertensive, or diabetic or all three, right? It impairs the activity of your help, help, helper T cells and all these immune cells that I described earlier, decreases antibody production, increases susceptibility to infection in the first place and likely to make it worse and then results in higher blood concentrations of inflammatory mediators and a chronic state of low level infection uh, or inflammation rather that is really health destroying. It leads to more susceptibility to severe COVID-19 and mortality than healthy weight adults. A systematic review, meta-analysis of 22 studies, obesity was associated with more severe COVID symptoms, higher risk of hospitalization, higher risk of admission to ICU, higher risk of ventilation, higher risk of acute respiratory distress syndrome. Obesity results in the chronic state of inflammation, which I've mentioned a couple of times, is a really bad state of health to be in. Obese people have delayed and diminished antiviral responses, hence more likely to have severe flu. They have poor recovery because the, the, the inflammation is persistent. All the immune function is going to unproductive activity, right? Obesity changes the viral life cycle, it increases it, makes it longer. Obese people shed virus longer than leaner people, so they tend to infect people around them. And they have internal terrain more likely to produce more viral mutations which perpetuate their illness. Weight loss lowers inflammatory markers. And even the composition of individual meals will affect inflammation. High fat meals can increase postprandial inflammation. Inflammation increases even more if the meal contains high amounts of advanced glycation end products or AGEs. And that effect is amplified in people who are obese or have type two diabetes. So now if you knew people who got really, really sick between 2020 and now, you may be starting to put the pieces together. The effect can be mitigated by eating high antioxidant foods like whole grains and vegetables. I mean, I think everybody here knows the right foods to eat. It's just the difficulty in making the shift. But you can see here on the left side, we have the high IG, AGE foods. And on the right side, you can see the difference, okay? Not much in sweet potatoes, celery, cucumbers, tomatoes. And again, the things you already know, even in some minimally processed foods like an Amy's veggie burger, you don't have much AGE there as opposed to bacon, 91,577 um, uh, AGEs per 100 grams. The activated immune system increases the demand for energy. The basal metabolic rate increases during fever. And it's one of the reasons why you lose weight. And it's not a crisis. By the way, people become apoplectic. Even I've seen this during cancer treatment, when people have the flu, colds, whatever, people become apoplectic about weight loss. I'm, I'm pretty lean, but believe me, if I lost 10 pounds because I had the flu and I let the fever go on so that I could get over it, I can regain the 10 pounds, right? It's the chronic health issues that come from trying to constantly suppress fevers and, and um, uh, try to make people eat when they're too sick to eat and that sort of thing. It's, it's ridiculous. We're so, in a country of people who are mostly overweight or obese, this focus on weight loss being a crisis if you're sick is really kind of hard to, diff very difficult to understand. Um, some micronutrients, by the way, have specific roles in immune function. So I'll show you a study about arginine uh, toward the end of this in a little bit here, but arginine stimulates the production of nitric oxide by macrophages that keeps your blood vessels open. Vitamin A and zinc regulate cell division, antioxidants like vitamin C and antioxidant enzymes like superoxide dismutase and glutathione address ROS or reactive oxygen species, which are generated by infection. 
Nutrients in plant foods contribute to several functions related to immunity. The development and maintenance of physical barriers, the production of and increased activity of antimicrobial proteins, growth differentiation and motility of your innate immune cells, phagocytic and killing activities of neutrophils and macrophages, and promotion of and recovery from inflammation. So it, it, the, the outcomes when you get sick are so different if you keep yourself in a great state of health, starting with what you put in your mouth every day. And by the way, when people tell me that it can't be that important, the average adult eats one ton, one ton of food every year. Think about what that would look like stacked on the street in front of your house. How can you argue that that would not make a difference? Of course it does. We even have specific research on plant-based diets in COVID-19. A study including 2,884 frontline healthcare workers from six countries who had ex extensive exposure. They were around patients all the time. Participants who followed plant-based diets had a 73% lower risk of moderate to severe COVID-19. Participants who followed a pescatarian diet, and it's, it's not as good, but better than normal, had a 59% lower risk. Participants who followed low carb, high protein diets had a higher risk of severe disease. So you start piling on all of this, you know, your overweight, chronic inflammation, your gut microbiome has been destroyed, you're dehydrated, you eat a terrible diet. No wonder people got very, very sick, right? Research at Johns Hopkins Children's Center, they took sulforaphane, which is a phytochemical in broccoli and cruciferous vegetables, has a really powerful effect against viruses like the common cold and SARS-CoV-2. They exposed cells to sulforaphane for one to two hours before infecting them uh, with CoV-2 and um, of the virus causing the common cold. The sulforaphane reduced viral replication of six strains of SARS-CoV-2, including Delta and Omicron by 50%. And the same was the, the effect was the same for the common cold. Giving 30 milligrams of sulforaphane per kilogram of body weight to mice before infecting them with SARS-CoV-2 decreased the loss of body weight, which is typically associated um, with COVID-19. And by the way, in really, really lean people or already compromised you know, people who are sick, that may, might make a huge difference. Pre-treatment with sulforaphane also decreased viral load in the lungs and upper respiratory tract and resulted in a 29% decrease in injury to lung tissue. So can you imagine what would happen if you ate cruciferous vegetables as a regular part of your diet? Go figure, right? And it's not, you know, and it doesn't matter which ones, by the way. So if you say, I hate broccoli, then eat different cruciferous vegetables. This is not contingent on any particular food as much as getting the pattern, right? And of course, rather than taking sulforaphane pills, whole foods are better. So broccoli, arugula, bok choy, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, and they contain other things besides just sulforaphane. So you really want the nutrients all packaged up in the whole food. So inflammation was a big characteristic of severe COVID-19. It increases the risk of cytokine storm. Often supplemental antioxidants and omega-3 fatty acids are recommended to address. And a Cochrane review basically said that there was no effect of omega-3 fatty acids and antioxidants on uh, SARS-CoV-2, not the duration or the propensity to end up on ventilators. Um, there is some increased risk of cardiac, GI, and total adverse events. Consumption of Western calorically rich diet is associated with a chronic state of inflammation and the high intake of saturated fat sugar and refined carbohydrate also. So, so the, the answer to this is not going on about your business, just continuing to do what you're doing if you're overweight and eating a bad diet and think that if something bad happens, you'll just pop some omega-3 fatty acid and antioxidant pills, or you'll take them every day as a way to um, reduce your risk. That's going to solve your problem. The key is get yourself healthy now. It will serve you well in the future. Saturated fat is particularly worth talking about. Um, dietary fats alter the membranes of immune cells and can interfere with immune function. Saturated fat has a particularly deleterious effect. And so you, your toll-like receptors are your first line weapons of the immune system against infection. And they're down-regulated within hours of just um, ingesting a bolus of saturated fat. So it's very distressing to watch the popularity of these ketogenic diets right now. Um, they have their role for epileptic children, they have their role for brain cancer patients, but the general public should not be consuming such a diet. Saturated fat also expresses, increases the expression of a COX-2 enzyme, which increases inflammation. 
saturated and unsaturated fatty acids when consumed in excess will increase inflammation and decrease your immune function. Omega-6 and polyunsaturated fat has the same effect on the toll-like receptors and are precursors to inflammatory molecules. They are pro-inflammatory. So this is why a low-fat diet, not a change the type of fat diet, is what I have recommended for years. And of course, when you reduce the fat and increase the fiber, things get better as well. The Finnish Diabetes Prevention Study, an increase in fiber intake was associated with a reduction in inflammatory molecules. And, um, and by the way, this becomes important because if you can lower your general inflammation levels, you will be less likely to get sick. In other words, who was the most likely to become ill with COVID? It was overweight, hypertensive, diabetic, or all three combined. High fiber intake results in lower body weight, which reduces obesity-related inflammation. The interaction between fiber and the bacteria in the gut microbiome will also result in lower inflammation. Your beneficial bacteria in the gut really like fiber. They feast on it and they produce anti-inflammatory molecules, and that's helpful. <music>